So let me start again with the scripture from yesterday. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God was with me and in me and through me. Sometimes you're sharing stuff and yet you've got some points on your, um, in your preparation and you're not, or you forget them. That happens to me quite often. So I'm going back to a few points that I had from, uh, for yesterday. Grace is a place to live from. Grace is the foundation and a place to work from. Grace is an apostolic prophetic picture, a place to walk from. When we are born again, we go on a journey. The journey actually starts from the moment we are born again to until the day Jesus is coming back or in between you die and go to heaven. And it's a journey. Like I said yesterday, in, in, in our life, the darkness around us is big and the path that we're walking on is sometimes quite small and narrow. And so the temptations and all the things in life, they can take us away from the purpose of life in Christ. So... On that journey, uh, and I'm just, again, just thinking of the fact that we as a local church, we exist almost the same as you, 23 years, we are existing 24 years. Thinking back of the start of the journey when the church was planted, and where we are today. We started with, let's say, 40 people, grew to 500 people, planted some churches, but the number of people that we walked with, and they were seduced. Some of them are still walking with God, but others are not walking with God anymore. They were, by deception, distracted and are walking in different roads. The number of people, if sometimes you, 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 you're sitting and thinking, what if everybody that came in for at least a few weeks would have stayed? And not in a way that they all should stay in one place. We want to plant churches, but still part of the same family and tribe. What if? So I was thinking, what's, what are the things that are drawing us away from those relations and the, the, those commitments to work together and to walk together? Now, I think this morning, if you were able to keep up to write all the points down... <laughs> so I asked Greg, are you going to unfold this the coming months? <laughs> but you know, you could hear his heart, a purpose to make sure we will have an impact in the nations and for the kingdom's sake. And it's not an easy thing. So I was thinking, maybe I can help you with one or two things. What do you think? Do you have blind spots in your life? <laughs> no, I think most people would say no, like Daniel. Because the, the whole thing with a blind spot is you, you don't see the spot. So, how do you discover you've got blind spots? Somebody tells you. So I think on our journey... And even when we are born again, the flesh is still in us. And it longs for stuff that's not helpful. And even with, with our upbringing, we bring things in us, still on the journey, that are blind spots. So we can be distracted, seduced, distracted by stuff that we are carrying without knowing it. And it's not helpful at all. So people are quite often, Christians are quite often misled by things that they are carrying in themselves. And we call them blind spots. And I don't know how it is with you, but I don't like it when somebody talks to me about a blind spot to me. Because I don't agree. Because I can't see. We've got a book at, at home. I never read it. Because, because my wife was quoting out of the book to me. 
<laughs> because the title of the book is Blind Spots. <laughs> but I remember one thing without reading the book. To be able to receive something from somebody else about a blind spot in your life, it means that you trusted other person more than yourself. That's a difficult one. Can you imagine that you trust somebody, his word, his love for you, that he's wanting to help you, that you trust him so much, that when he tells, tells you something about, this is something not helpful in your life, Jonathan, that he's trusting me so much, that he, when he looks at himself in the mirror in his life, he says, I can't see it, I don't see it, I don't see it. But I trust Getjan so much that I'm going with this word to God and say, Lord, can you show it to me? Because if he tells me something like that, surely, because I know his heart, he's for me, not against me. And I think we are too often too stubborn, as, also as Christians, not allowing people to talk into our lives. And if you want to, draw, to journey in, in the future of this church, you need solid relations in your life to make sure on that journey you're not going to be distracted. So I was comparing two men, Saul and David, as leaders. The effectiveness of leadership depends on the elimination of lids that are placed upon us. The leadership of David and Saul give us two examples of leaders who dealt with lids in different ways. Starting, first, first, both were anointed by God. They had the same anointing that was on Saul as on David. They were anointed as kings. So on our journey, when I look 24 years ago, when we started, Gert started the church and we walked with them. With the number of people that we walked for the first 10 years, we all were born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, with a calling on our life. No difference. All the same. Same purpose, to extend the kingdom of God and to follow Jesus Christ. No exception. Same calling. Same anointing. Same Holy Spirit. Same, same power. There was no difference at all. The anointing was the same. Both received the help of an experienced prophet in their lives. Both Saul and David had instructions and teachings. Saul instructed by Samuel and David by Nathan, the prophet. Both of them had a prophet in their life that counseled them. Both of them. Both faced great challenges. God tested our leadership through the challenges and the obstacles along the way. Goliath challenged Saul just as much as he challenged David. But the only one, David responded to overcome the enemy. Both had the same chance to change and to grow. Saul and David had different attitudes in the, in the face of their circumstances. After Samuel reprimanded Saul, Saul merely tried to justify himself. David, on the other hand, repented bitterly, when after Nathan rebuked him. Do you see that your attitude for voices into your life can save you? If you're open for the voices around you, trustworthy men, they help you to steep on and keep on the narrow road to be and stay effective. I think there are so many Christians, they are born again, they will go to heaven. But the question is, are they effective for the king? Can the king ask you to do something in power because you are walking in his will? The lids and limitations on King Saul's life. Fear. He hide himself in the camp because he was afraid to face Goliath. He was concerned with opinions of others. He even asked Samuel to honor him even after he had sinned. How can you do that? We have to be open and honest with ourselves, even when we make mistakes. 
I don't like it when somebody confronts me with a mistake, but we learned over the years, and also 10 years ago when we took over the church, we said to the eldership team, guys, we are going to make a decision. We will do our utmost best to follow Jesus Christ, but we will make mistakes, not on purpose, but in our journey, we will make mistakes, and we allow that we are making mistakes, but in the same time, we open our hearts to be corrected to make them right. Because we're not Jesus. So allow yourself to make mistakes, but in the same time, allow somebody else to correct you when it's necessary to come back on the narrow road again, to be effective and stay effective. I think too often we're not honest enough with each other. We can say we love each other, but if you see me doing something stupid and you don't tell me, you don't love me. I love Greg, and he's my friend. When he's coming in at, into our church, and we are opening our church and say after a week, please tell me, is there anything that you see in my life or in the life of the elders or in the church that's not helpful, please tell us. If he's going back and says, no, it was nice, it's great, blah, 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 I'm disappointed. Honestly. Because I know there's a lot of things that we can do better. And I'm not waiting to get a hiding or something like that. No. No. You know, sometimes it can happen in the church, but I'm talking now, if guys are coming into our church and they, 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 they le are leaving again and they say, it was great, you nice church, etc., I'm disappointed. On one side, I'm happy because it sounds good. But if you're coming in as a gift, I also want to hear some stuff that I can work on as an eldership team. Why? Because I know we've got blind spots. I know for myself when I stay too long in the church and I'm not traveling out for at least a weekend, I'm getting blind by, how do you call it in business also, that you are getting tunnel vision. Good, thank you. And it's true. So we need voices in our lives that are far enough to be able to see and close enough that you can trust to take them serious. Saul was also presumption. He did not wait for Samuel to offer the sacrifice and he wasn't qualified to do that. He was impulsive. He made rash, a rash oath that almost cost the life of his son. He was jealous and envy. He became angry when people unfavorably compared him with David. How are you doing? And actually at a, at, at a later stage, he, all, he actually hated David because he was so successful. If you look at the limits in David's life, it was his family. We heard it yesterday. It was a poor family. He was overlooked. His social status was poor and, and Saul was rich. As his leader Saul was constantly trying to block the growth process in David's life. He was young and inexperienced. So I was thinking, if we are on a journey personally, and I shared it a few weeks ago in our church with some people, and it's not my stuff, but I, I, I think it's so wonderful and so helpful, <laughs> so I'm going to share it. And I'm honest, it's not mine. We, need, we, can, we, we could use four types of people in our life that help us to, to be successful and to stay on the, on, the, on the narrow path. Models, mentors, partners, and friends. So the models in your life, who inspires you by, your, by, by example? Who do you... Look at, by gifting maybe. Like if you're a prophet, you can take Mike as a model. And did you ever write books? Not yet. Still working on it, so. Okay, but you can, can imagine, if somebody is your model, you want to read about his life, his development, etc. 
because you, could, you want to learn. But the mentors, who's coaching you? Who's fathering you? Do you have a mentor in your life, a father figure? I discovered in Holland, when I'm asking with men and talking with men, and I'm asking, do you have a mentor? I only met one that said, I had a men mentor for 10 years. A father figure in your life that has a voice in your life that can advise you in your life. I found only one guy so far. And I was thinking, why? Maybe one, one of the things, one of the things, if your upbringing in, in your own house wasn't the best, then you can imagine when you're 18 to 20, you want to get out of the house. You want to, because you're maturing, you want to have your own household. So what ha quite often happens, you're fighting yourself out of the authority of your parents. And when I'm free, I'm my own boss. So you fought a fight to get away from that authority. But in the same time, when you do it with that attitude, you're blocking yourself for allowing mentors to having a voice in your life. Because they play a similar role. So when you fought your parents to get away from their authority, probably you find it quite difficult to have a mentor in your life. So, why do we need those four types of people, like friends and partners? Partners who share the same dream and work with you, and friends who love you and pray with you. They stand next to you. For me, like Case is an elder in my church, in our, and we are in the same, on the same eldership. He is a partner and a friend. He's not my mentor. He can be a mentor, but he's not. He's my partner. and my, He's standing next to me. We are on the same journey. We strengthen each other like iron sharpens iron. We are standing together in the, with the same journey to follow Jesus leading the church. For me, Greg is more a mentor. I can phone him, I can ask questions, and he's open and honest. When he's coming in our church, he's overlooking, and over, he's like an overseer. He's coming in and sees the church. He's feeling the temperature in the church. And because he's coming more than once, I think he's already 12 times in our church. He knows people. He knows the development. So when he's walking in, he feels where the church is. And he can talk and speak into what's happening in the church within, let's say, 30 minutes. That's what we need. Those type of people in our life. So why you need a team of those four people in your life? To make up for your, your own weaknesses. Romans 1.12 I want us to help each other with the faith we have. Your faith will help me and my faith will help you. So, my blind spot and my weaknesses. I need other people on this journey because I'm only a small part of the whole puzzle. One small piece. I would be very arrogant to think that I'm Jesus or the solution for, and I'm the guy. I'm not. I have to accept the fact that I only have a gift, but it's only a small part of the whole body. I have to play my role, but that's it. I need the others. To bring out the best in me. That's why I need those four people in my life, to bring the best out of me. When I listen this morning to those 30, 40 points, <laughs> I couldn't keep up. But I can tell you, a few of them, they hit me. They hit me. And I need people in my life that are able sometimes to hit me with words that, oh my goodness, I have to change stuff in my life. Because by that, they, 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 they bring the best out of me. 
Talking about fresh bread, I was a baker for 18 years, so I know what it is to have daily fresh bread. But I went to school because I want to have a degree in pastry. And the teacher, we had coming exams to make decorations for wedding cakes, etc. And we, we made our own de decorations. So we could try and, and make stuff and uh, then to show him, is this good enough for the exams, etc. And he was always pushing me to say, no, it's not good enough. Go make it again. No, it's not good enough. Why? He saw something in me, and he knew that I could do better, so he didn't accept the things that I put in the first two times on the table. Now go back, you can do better. It frustrated me. But looking back, he was pushing me, and pushing me because he saw something in my life. He cared for me. Didn't feel like it. Do you recognize that in your life? So be joyful when people don't accept your rubbish. And they're pushing you because they know and they, they, they see and they care. There's more in you. You can do better. To get more done. That's why you need those people. To, working together, you get more done. With different giftings in the team, you get more done. You can make decisions on yourself, good decisions. With a team and people around you, you make better decisions. With mentors and friends and partners you make the, and the Holy Spirit, you make the best decisions. Why would you make a good decision and say that's good enough? You could be, make a better decision or you can make the best decision. Go for the best. Consult people. Allow them to speak into the situation. To make sure you are and become more effective in Christ. Also one of the reasons why you need those people is to help, me to, uh, help you to get back when you stumble on your feet again. Because we will fall. And we will face difficulties. You need people around you that stand with you and pray with you. For a Moses that they keep up your hands. Whatever is necessary that people are behind you. Blowing wind into your sails, whatever you're doing. In your personal life, in your marriage, when you're raising up your kids. You know, the challenges of, of life are so huge. And God meant it for us to, to work together, to be together, to be family and to stand together on our journey. That's why we need local churches, that's why we need family, that's why we need teams within teams within teams. I'm not a musician. I, can't, yeah, I, I can worship in myself, in my spirit, but I love the fact that we've got children's workers, musicians, people that like to serve food, coffee. Isn't that amazing? Honor them. Thank them. Because they're part of the body and they function in their gifting. But if we stumble, they raise, raise us up. When you're down, they pray for you. We need each other. Ecclesiastic 4. You have to read it when you're at home. The whole of it. Yeah, why not? But at least first 9, 10 to 12. Because it says, if you fall, a companion can help you to get up. But if you fall by yourself, you're in real trouble. Because there's no one to help you. Also why we need those people to resist, resist attacks and criticism. Ecclesiastic 4, 12. By yourself you are unprotected. An enemy can attack you and defeat you, but two can stand back to back and resist. And a team of three is even better. We need people in our life closely to us. In our generation, and maybe even more in Europe, people are so on their own. Freedom for them means that you're not connecting to people. Freedom means that you only yourself are deciding and make decisions where you're going, what you're doing, how you're doing, etc. It's my right to make my own decision. But the consequences of that generation, the way they walk... 
It's terrible. The brokenness is increasing rapidly, and they don't understand why. And one of the reasons is they walk alone. Independent. Totally. They make the most stupid mistakes that are not necessary. So, if you want to search for those people, I've got five points where you can, that you can take in your thinking. What to look for in choosing those people. Choose people who want to, lo who want to love and to serve God. Life's quite simple. So it's not by words that people say, I love you and I want to serve. No, you look for people that practice what they say. Too many Christians, blah, 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 blah. And if, when you look at your, their lives, you don't see what they say. So don't follow and don't invite those people to help you to be one of those four, let's say a friend or a mentor or a partner, because they will not help you. Because what they're modeling, you will probably cope, or you will be influenced by what they are modeling. You know, I'm a grandfather, and I love it. So my, 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 my oldest grandson, he's six. On his birthday, he said, Grandpa, I will get a, a mountain bike with spring feather and gears. And he was so excited because he knows I'm cycling in the forest with a mountain bike. So I think it was Friday he received his bike. So Sunday, his mom was sending a text. Can you ask Opa to come and cycle with me through the forest? <laughs> sure. I had some plans, but Sure. One thing, we have to connect the generations. It was a good word this morning to pray for the older people because they are experienced. And you should allow all the people to have a voice in your life. So, my grandson is six. So, I think we were 100 or 200 meters from their house into the forest. First corner, he fell. Of course, he didn't know what to do. He was only used to, to cycle on, on, a, on a nice pavement, and now in the sand, and it's a different ball game. And man, the look at his face, the vulnerability on his face, when he fell the first time, Grandpa, is it okay that I fall? He was touching and, and trying to find out, am I allowed to fall and to grow, or are you judging me and I'm a failure or not? Gee. That softens your heart, but that's the way, that type of, that type of people you need in your life. Because when you fall, you want that, comp because then you're, that's fragile when you fall. And you want people around you that look at you as grandfathers and say, Hey, my boy, that's part of the whole game. I told him, you know, Grandpa, two weeks ago, I also still f fell from my, my bike. Because it's a difficult thing to cycle through the forest. You have to learn by falling and standing up again. And you know, that's what we need in local churches. Relations that encourage you when you fall to stand up and say, it's part of the whole journey. It's your growing process. Choose those people in your life that have that compassion with you and love for you. Like grandfathers for their grandsons, I hope. But I have. Choose people that are committed to growing in their character. If I would stop opening my life for people around me to have a voice in my life, to pinpoint my blind spots in my life, 
and it's not your wife, please. Oh, we had that conversation with the man's breakfast. And I said, who's your mentor? And they all started, my wife. I said, no, you're not understanding what I'm saying. But you know, to be honest, if your wife is pinpointing a blind spot, you can't handle it. And you don't want to hear it from her, even when she's right. In the same time, when she's telling you you're doing something good, you can't take it fully. Why not? Because you know she lo- that you know that she loves li- you unconditionally. So how honest is she? She's your biggest supporter, but you always think, yeah, yeah, you say that because you're my wife. So for me, I say we need those relations of men, and if you're a woman, woman that speak openly and honestly, that you can receive it, even what your wife already told you at home. But people that are committed to growing in their character. I've seen, like I said, for the last 24 years, people come into our church, been born again, filled with the Holy Spirit. They didn't allow people to speak into their life and they were shutting down in developing their character. And God, by the grace of God, sometimes, act, and also for our journey, and also probably for New Day, if you are getting stuck because you make the decision, He can't use you. And He will be patient and with you and gracious with you for maybe months or maybe a few years, but the, probably it's coming a day that says, you're blocking my process in this church. Get out of the way. That's going to be a dangerous place. So I want, again, urge you, stay open for the Holy Spirit. Stay open for those relations in your life. How difficult it it is, I actually don't care. And I know it's difficult. I had a month month ago a meeting with, and just a week before I was, I fell off my bike and I had a, a knee blue like this. It was very painful. It was bruised. A week later, I had a meeting with some leaders, and they were talking to me. And my whole soul felt as bruised as my knee when I walked out of that meeting. Confronted with stuff in my life, and God wanted me to deal with it. But the first, Maybe 20 minutes, I stepped out, of that, stepped out of me out of that meeting. I felt so bruised. It's not nice when you're confronted with stuff in your personality or in your character that God wants to deal with. And people are open and honest with you. But do I have a choice? Do you think you have a choice to not, to, to not allow stuff like that in your life? Immediately, I made a decision to put stuff in practice to solve the problems in my own life and in the situation. Why? Because it's not about me. And it's not about my character. It's about the king and the kingdom. And I laid down my life for him. How difficult it is. Whatever they're confronting me with it, if it's confirmed by the Holy Spirit, I, ha- I have no option than lay down my life and surrender to him. Choose people who do the right thing even when it's hard. If you are careful to obey whatever God commands, then you will be doing what is right and good in God's eyes. Then I will help you and your children will be successful. People who do what is right may have many problems, but the Lord will solve them all. Look at their lives, how they handle pressure on their life. I was talking lately to one of the leaders, and there's a huge pressure on his life. And it wasn't the situation, but out of the situation, some character things came to the surface. And I said, my friend, you have to work on those two issues. 
And he said, yeah, but the circumstances. I said, no, I'm not talking about the presence. I'm talking what's happening and it's coming to the surface now. Those two things you have to, God is giving you now because he's putting pressure on your life to work on those two things. I didn't tell, but I can tell you, if you're not working on those things, God can, he will bring it back again. And again, but if you're not willing, after three, four times, you will reap from that. And I care too much for you to let you off the hook with the, those things. That type of people we need in our lives, that will fight for you, even when you are blind and sometimes too stubborn and sometimes too stupid. To understand why you need those corrections in your life. And they will chase you until you do it. I want to be a person for other people. And I want other people in my life that do the same. Choose people who are handling criticism by focusing on God. Greg was sharing about that stuff already. Choose people who take bold risks in faith. You don't need people in your life that only calculating, and if they calculate it and they by reason can understand it, make decisions. You need people that are able to hear the voice of God and are willing and trusting and making decisions that demands faith in God. Look at their life, the decisions that they made. Too many Christians, especially in Europe, are so calculated and are in their comfort zone. And they say Dutch people are pioneers, but we should be pioneers. But too ma many people, in, let's say in Holland, are too spoiled. The life in the comfort zone for the last 50 years. It's too comfortable for Dutch people. And some churches are helping that thought also by giving the people what they want instead of challenging them to be part of an army. It's uncomfortable to follow Jesus. It will cost you. It's a price to pay to follow Jesus. And I want to follow and hang out with people that are willing to make steps in faith and to be courageous and bold. Even when, uh, let's, what we said, that sometimes you can miss it and make a stupid decision or make, make a fault. It's at least go. I've seen too many people sitting on the, on the road instead of walking. You have to be bold to keep on walking in faith even when you make mistakes. I remember a picture that God said, you know, too many Christians are sitting beside the road because they know they go to heaven. And God said, when you sit, I can't use you. You have to keep on walking. Because when you walk with me, you make decisions in faith, you trust in God, and it's a risky thing, but you're going. And when you're going, I can steer you. But when you're sitting, I can't do anything with you. You're useless. So where are you? Are you sitting or are you in action? Because in action, you know, I can tell you when the church was planted in Holland and Gerd was, was laying the foundations and he invited us to become a home group leader. We'd never heard about home group leaders. And he was teaching on a Sunday and he was allowing us to do what we th were taught on Sunday. And then he would phone me on a, th a Thursday. How are you doing? What's happening? How can I help you? It was training on the job. The best way to be trained is training on the job. Don't go to whatever schools and go for four years to training on the job. I'm not against education it's, it's at all. I'm for it. But training on the job with people that you can trust and people that are standing with you. Choose people that are bold enough to take risks. So my action plan for you to give to you Oh yeah, that's one, one last thing. If you, like mentors are fathers, if you want to become a father, or you are already a father figure, make sure 
that you as a father are fathered by other fathers. It's not that you are now re reach the top and you make sure you you're also keep on f being fathered by other guys. So, for your homework, look 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 for those four pe four types of people: models, mentors, partners, and friends. Amen.